Hello, and here we are again with another fantastic uh, session for Indie Recon. And I'm going to be talking to somebody who is an old friend of uh, the Alliance of Independent Authors and Indie Recon. Hello, Miss Jane Freeman. Hello, Orna. And I think a lot of you will know that uh, Jane lectures in digital media at the University of Virginia and is also a freelance consultant to authors and really one of the most knowledgeable people in the author space. Um, there is nothing this woman doesn't know about what's going on in trade publishing, in um, self-publishing, in micro-publishing, in any kind of publishing you want to know about. And what Jane is going to talk about today, I think is actually the most important thing. It ties into the session we've just had with Joy um, from Publish. And it's very, it's called content marketing by marketing people. And of course, authors in general don't like marketing terms, but it's really about uh, how you use um, your own work to reach your, your readership. Is that right, Jane? That's how I think of it. That's right, yeah. And it's the first thing you've got to do is get out of the mindset that it's horrible marketing over here and beautiful writing over there and, and see that these two things actually are one. So Jane's going to bring us through um, one of her fantastic presentations and then we'll come back at the end and have a bit of a chat about some of the issues arising. Over to you, Jane. Wonderful, thank you so much. Uh, just give me a second while I do a screen share. So everyone should now see, I hope, my slides. Orna, can you confirm? Um, I'm not seeing them, I'm afraid. Oh, let's try it again. Ah, there we are. Not okay. really colored -y circles, yes. Yes. We got, it. we got it. All right, very good. Okay. So I think before I get into some of the nitty gritty here of content marketing, I'd like to do a little marketing communications refresher, uh, sponsored by Alec Baldwin <laughs> <laughs> of Glengarry Glen Ross. Um, I can't actually remember his character's name, but if anyone has seen that movie or the play, you'll know that it starts off with this speech about AIDA as well as ABC, always be closing. I just want to talk about the AIDA, which people who are in publishing if they haven't had any kind of marketing or business training, might not be aware of this like long held tenant of marketing communications. So, you know, usually when you're doing social media or you're doing email newsletters or blogging or you're doing anything that communicates with readers, you probably either have a very sales focused message or a very message focused message, what we would call it branding. And there's kind of a sequence that people go through when they hear a message. And so first there's just awareness that you exist in the first place, which is then followed by some comprehension of who you are and what you do, like a beginning to understand what your brand is. And then as time goes on and they have more impressions or experiences with you or your content, there's a conviction that's formed that turns into a, a sale. So content marketing uh, is concerned about the sale, but it doesn't, it sees it as kind of like the exclamation point at the very end of a sentence. So a lot of the communication that you engage in as part of content marketing is very message focused. It's about building trust and relationships, uh, knowing that if you've, if you're sending the right message to the right prospect, it's going to pay off eventually. It's a long term game. That's the most important thing to understand. So another marketing concept that I like to introduce, since not everyone's heard of it before, is this idea of a funnel. And the funnel for an author is typically, uh, you know, the first book actually leading to the next book and the next book and the next book. But there are lots of different ways that people might come across you other than just discovering your book out of the blue. They might see you on social media, for instance, or come across your blog, or uh, find your email newsletter. So there are lots of different touch points today that there didn't used to be uh, before the internet. And so often people will interact with you many different times before they end up at, let's say, your book release where they would actually be purchasing something. So part of content marketing is understanding on both a big picture level and like on a smaller detail tactical level, 
how people kind of find you and then where they end up over time and understanding that flow of, of readers through your funnel. I'm, for those of you who are novelists or otherwise writing narratives, and especially anything that would be in a series, you know, the funnel is best expressed by, you know, the very first book in the series, which grabs people. It's often free, especially in the self-publishing community. And then if people really love that first book, it's very natural for them to buy the second and the third and the fourth and the fifth. So that's like the most simple form of a funnel that we might talk about. The one thing I want to point out is that when we talk about content marketing, often we're talking about things that are free or very close to free. So there is a bigger picture here of things that you offer for very for free, for very cheap, for moderate prices, and then at premium prices. So when we talk about content marketing, we're talking about things that are generally giveaways or very close to free because that gets us new readership. But don't forget that there are always more premium experiences that you'll be thinking about. People kind of at the very, very end of the funnel who are invested, they're loyal, they're fans, they're, they might even be part of, let's say, a street team of people who are going to help spread the word about your work and be buying like buying into the, the best things that you have to offer. So there is a spectrum of things. It's not that everything you produce is going to be part of a content marketing initiative, but for this presentation, we're really focused on the very early, early impressions that you're making where you're trying to increase uh, your readership and you know uh, cast a wider net. So one question that we're always asking on a strategic level is that when people do encounter your free work and they enjoy it, what action are they taking? And what can you learn from that action? And also, once they have that piece of free content, how can uh, they how can you stay in touch with that person? So if any of you have been following uh, some recent trends with giveaways, and I believe this was recently expressed on Joanna Penn's blog. I can't remember the specific name of the author who expressed this, but he talks about how you have a free ebook that you give away, and then you have an email newsletter sign up at the very beginning, and you attract people to that email newsletter because you're going to give them a second free book. And then that way you're building a list of prospects for the next book that releases. Obviously this takes like three books in order to be effective, but there are other methods that you can use um, to kind of get people into the funnel. And we're gonna go over what some of those are. So some examples, uh, they, they tend to differ a little bit for fiction versus nonfiction. So for fiction, as I've pointed out, free eBooks are like the biggest way to content market. Also serialization of full length books is very common. For nonfiction, it tends to lend itself so easily to content marketing through things like blogging and email newsletters, podcasting, free webinars like this one that I'm giving right now is a really good example of content marketing. Um, on the fiction side, sometimes uh, it's harder to come up with ways that, that make sense, uh, especially like, you know, it's hard to kind of chunk up a narrative in the same way that you might chunk up a nonfiction book. But there are still many things you can do related to interview series with other authors who are similar to you, any kind of book clubs or reading groups. For instance, CJ Lyons has a book club related to thrillers with heart uh, that's on Goodreads that she started. So building up some recognition around your genre and other authors in the community is a form of content marketing. To speak specifically to blogs, because this is you know, one of the most popular and well-known ways to market yourself, there are lots of different ways to use a blog for content marketing. And sometimes people think it just has to be original content, but it doesn't. You don't have to start from scratch. You can repurpose stuff that's existing. And in fact, repurposing is one of the key principles of great content marketing. And we'll come back to that point. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, you can also just do, instead of coming up with original content yourself, you can lean on other people a little bit by doing interviews and Q and A's. Uh, particularly people who are well known and are likely to help spread the word about the interview that was done. And then also the link roundup where you collect information, articles, stories, interesting things that are happening. You do that on a weekly or a monthly basis. That's another way to consistently put out blog content that acknowledges a wider community uh, and uh, is a good marketing tool. 
So if you do blog, there's, there's so many things that then kind of get put into motion as far as other content that you're posting on social media. And the really strategic people will in fact have a calendar for this kind of activity, an editorial calendar or a content strategy calendar kind of mapping out either on a daily, weekly or monthly basis, what the theme is. Uh, or what they're trying to accomplish or what is their goal for that period of time. So what I have up on the screen now is an example of, let's say you were going to release a book on, on Italy, whether that was like an Italy memoir or um, an Italy cookbook, whatever it happens to be. And then you can think on a month to month basis based on other activities happening, how you're gonna roll out the content early on so that by the time the book comes out, you've got people really interested and excited and invested in what's happening. The other thing that's often do done with blogging as well as podcasts and other forms of media is some kind of a series. So some of you have probably heard of like 30 day challenges. Um, NaNoWriMo is one of the biggest and most popular well-known challenge. There are all sorts of variations of this, but anything that kind of builds on itself tends to get spread a little more easily because people are following along and telling their friends about it and trying to get um, you know, a group experience going. Now I wanna segue into email. So I've already mentioned email newsletters a little bit, and I just want to point out that sometimes emails get overlooked as a form of content marketing because sometimes email is considered like this old, dead medium, which is, of course, nonsense. It's just as active and profitable as it ever was. And this graph that I'm showing you here kind of exemplifies that, that when you get a reader on your email list, they tend to have higher value over time than customers or readers that you only reach through social media. This isn't to say that social media is not valuable. It's only to say that a customer's lifetime value tends to be more if they're on their email list because that indicates more engagement and more investment in what you're offering. This slide does not really pertain to word of mouth, which is really important for every author. It's really just looking at what a person ends up buying depending on how you how they uh, hear about your information. So just to touch on some of the email content marketing strategies, I tend to divide it up into what we would call time sensitive and then not time sensitive. So anything that's time sensitive, you know, usually has to do with book launches and events, competitions, giveaways, discounts. Um, and then usually for content marketing though, we're really looking at the not time sensitive because as I said, this is a long-term game. So the time sensitive stuff is usually what we would call the like the sales focused messaging or communication, which is fine. But what I'm really uh, talking about in the context of this presentation is how over a long period of time, you're building a relationship with your readers um, through behind the scenes or serializations, interesting offers, interviews, those types of things. The most important thing with email is consistency in what you're sending to people so that there aren't any surprises. Um, so there's all sorts of forms of consistency, like consistent um, format, um, consistent branding or look and feel, a consistent voice from you, and consistent um, timing. The most popular service providers I have listed on this slide, I really like MailChimp, uh, and it's free up to 2,000 names. Um, but there are lots of other services you can take a look at. Tiny Letter is very popular with journalists. Um, and then probably the biggest competitor to MailChimp is Campaign Monitor. So I want to touch on the role of social media in all of this. And I think social media is great for spreading word of mouth. It's really poor for sales driven messages, but it's really great when you're offering something that's easy to say yes to. So stuff that's free. <laughs> so like when I talked about this session today, I talked about it on Twitter and on Facebook and on Google Plus and LinkedIn and people are tend to be very open to that message because it's a, a free little cheese cube. They don't actually have to commit a lot. They just kind of have to show up. In fact, they, I believe they won't even have to show up to this live. You can look at the recording. So using this free content often will introduce ways to commit further down the line. And so it, it's that trust and relationship building that I've been talking about. And then social media also allows you to build relationships with other people or partner up with other organizations. Um, and that just kind of adds rocket fuel to the whole process. 
I also like to see social media as like kind of a form of micro publishing. So anytime you're putting out a tweet or a Facebook update or images on Instagram or Pinterest, you know, that's content. And sometimes people don't recognize that as much as they should. And so you can take little tips from your work or scenes or lines and re-envision how that could have life on different social media challenges. And then it becomes strategically a part of your whole content marketing plan. And it goes both ways. The things that you create new on social media can then be re-envisioned and created into work that people pay for. A classic example of this is when you have a blogger who's written for years uh, or serialized their work for years, and then they compile all that into a book, like a print book that people can buy. So I want to go through some examples on social media specifically of how we can see free content circulating and how it can build an audience. Uh, here's an example from a very popular website called Simple Green Smoothies. Obviously, this would be geared towards nonfiction authors. But you'll, they list the entire recipe for the smoothie in Instagram itself, along with a photo of, uh, of the recipe. And you can see that there's a lot of engagement there. Here's an example on Pinterest from a publicist who took a lot of tips they had on book publicity and, and general publicity and put them into these little quote images. I'm sure many of you have seen the use of quotes as image blocks, both on Pinterest and Tumblr, or Facebook, like they're everywhere. And they're everywhere because they work really well. So you can see how this takes what is not actually visual content at all, but really makes creative use of Pinterest as a medium. One of my most popular posts of all time on Tumblr is this infographic, you can only see the top half, uh, called Got Writer's Block. And this was an infographic produced by the New York Book Editors Association um, right at the time of their launch. This has been about a year and a half ago. And this, this infographic has been now shared over 50,000 times on Tumblr. And it has been really useful for that organization in spreading the word about what they do. So, um, and the reason, you know, we call this content marketing rather than just plain old marketing is that we're giving some we're giving people something really useful, fun, entertaining, something that they want to share. Um, so that's for, for anyone who's kind of wondering about the difference between those two things. I think this particular piece really exemplifies that. Scott Sigler, a novelist, is really well known for podcasting his books chapter by chapter. So he reads them himself and makes the podcasts available for free from his site. He's done this for years now, and it's really a cornerstone of his content marketing strategy. So you can basically listen to his books for free, but if you want an ebook or a print book, that's when you have to pay. You can also see forms of content marketing and how all of the box sets are now uh, coming out from different uh, collaborations of genre fiction writers in particular. So The Deadly Dozen was a collaboration among 12 thriller novelists and it sold for 99 cents. It wasn't free, but it was really, really, really cheap or next to free considering you were getting 12 full length books. And so that acts as a form of bringing new readers into your circle. And then to get really, really traditional, if you looked at LinkedIn groups, a lot of networking and content marketing often happens there where you're giving advice to other people. This works really well, particularly for any kind of freelancers, experts, authorities, people who have a knowledge base where they can be helpful to people in certain interest areas. And even if people don't necessarily hire you because of your activity in these groups, just your participation there increases your visibility on that particular social network. And there's always uh, kind of serendipity that strikes in these sorts of situations where even if you're not getting hired or uh, even if you're not making sales, there are these promotional things that happen where people invite you to be an interviewer or an interviewee or uh, a guest on a podcast, or they might end up reviewing your book. For video or, or YouTube, the classic example of content marketing is John Green, the YA author whose book, The Fault in Our Stars, was recently released as a movie. 
and he is really made for video and it's really hard to tell you go be like John Green because there's only one John Green and he's very charismatic on screen. But it again, when you look at what he's doing, classic content marketing of doing this wonderful series that gathers a community of people who are just kind of custom made to enjoy his books. There's also uh, a strategy of writing a manifesto, which one of my favorite manifestos of all time is written by Chris Gillibeau, who did 279 Days to Overnight Success. This is an 11,000 word downloadable PDF that you can still go get from his site absolutely free. It's been out for many years now, I think maybe seven years at this point, and it's still going strong because the information is so valuable. And you figure, gosh, if he's giving this valuable jam away for free, what would I get if I actually paid 20, 30 or $40 for his more formal um, products and services? Quora was very exciting when it first launched. Um, I don't, uh, I don't personally participate on it now, but again, it's a kind of a classic environment where you can raise your profile and, sh and show your value and build trust by answering questions from a community around particular subject areas. So part of what I'm talking about now that we've gone through all of those different examples is really thinking about how your content or expertise or ideas can take a lot of different forms and be re repurposed or re-envisioned in many different ways. So you can see this even in my own practice where I have blog posts that end up in books and then they become presentations and I also tweet tips from them and I have magazine articles that spin off of it and YouTube videos which are tapes of my presentations which are built on my books. So it's kind of this very incestuous circle of content that I'm just thinking about all of the different ways to take advantage of it um, because people interact in different ways or have different preferences um, for mediums and some you will charge for and others you won't. So the model is different for every single writer or author. And it, part of the challenge is kind of figuring out what's going to be sustainable for you and what leads to a model that actually puts money in your pocket. So to give you a very kind of clear diagram of what I mean. So one of my classic topics for myself, uh, this would of course apply to just about any nonfiction author, um, how to get your book published. So the free stuff that I offer is a very comprehensive blog post, a one hour webinar, a big sample from my book. And then I have inexpensive levels of commitment, like an ebook edition for $3.99, articles in Writer's Digest magazine. And then there's moderate levels of commitment and then more expensive levels of commitment. For a novelist or for any type of narrative work, you can see this happening through free first chapters, even free first installments in a series or the serializations, email newsletters. And then you have this, I, uh, Richard Nash likes to call it the demand curve. So you'll have maybe thousands of people taking advantage of the free or inexpensive offerings. And then as they come through the funnel, um, you have a smaller and smaller percentage of people who will take advantage of the most expensive, but it's enough um, to make a living often. If you can just get, say, the five or the 10 or the 20 people who are willing to invest in that writing retreat or that special event with you with the really uh, great personalization or customization just for them. So as you're doing this, the, the way to take it to the next level is to actually start measuring what works, where you actually are making an impact with what's free. So it's really important when you're giving stuff away to understand how that's leading to people uh, who actually will invest. So there are usually two questions at play. First, how are people finding you? Is it through your site? Is it through social media? Is it through some other form? And then what action are people taking, which I call engagement. So the how people are finding you um, for our purposes for content marketing, they're usually finding that those content marketing pieces through just basic search or through referrals or what we would call word of mouth. And that word of mouth can happen through social media or through other people's sites like people's blogs 
we're not so much concerned with the other forms I've listed like email and direct because those are people that are probably already invested. But how are new people finding you? It's often through search and referral. And then what action do people take when they do find you? Do they seem to be really engaged? Are they spending a lot of time with the content? Are you getting a lot of emails? Are people signing up for your newsletter? So you want to try and measure the impact that the free content has so you know whether to continue with it, change it, think about other offerings that might be more effective. And to do this, you really need to have, well, the first step is to have Google Analytics installed on your site um, and to also have um, some level of control and insight into what's happening like with your email newsletter and with any other forms of marketing that you're putting out. So like being able to look at your Twitter analytics, for example. So, so you can put all the pieces together and see how people are moving through this ecosystem that you've created. So what you can find out from both Google Analytics and other social media analytics is, you know, how people are finding you very specifically, how people behave when they find the content, what keywords are really interesting to people that engage them, um, and how what percentage of people finding you are totally new to you versus actually just returning. So that's a very, very broad overview of what it means to be a, a good strategic content marketer. Um, I do have to be my own good content marketer. If you want to take advantage of the inexpensive or more moderate ways of learning with me, I've got my book, Publishing 101, which we're giving away a copy today. And then I also have a six week course coming up called MBA for Writers to help people understand how to better run the business side of their career. So I'm going to stop sharing now so people can see my face. <laughs> Fantastic, as always. Um, so we've got about another 20 minutes or so. And um, what I'd like to do with this time is, is something just a, a little bit different, because I think between your presentation there and um, the information that we had with the previous speaker who was, who was you know, looking at a similar topic from a very different perspective, I think those two sessions together essentially give the writer, everything. Are you still there, Jane? Yeah, I'm still here. Yeah, okay. I'm still, I'm still just seeing your screen. I just wondered if you were, if you had left us. No, that's good. Um, yeah. So I think you know how to do it is there. It's brilliantly dis dis described, and uh, how to think about it is there. But what I'd like to to do with you, because you have access to so many authors, and you've been looking at the scene, you know, for so long and in such depth from your academic um, perspective, as well as being out there at the cold front yourself. Um, you're a very unusual combination. And I'd like to just kind of have a little bit of a chat with you um, to tease out some of the issues arising from all of this around mindset, particularly. So you meet a lot of authors. I mean, you you worked on a, a review, a, a university review. You, you work in a university. Can you talk to me a little bit about how essential is it, do you think, for a writer to move in the kinds of directions that you're talking about and that we're all always talking about um, online? If you want to make a living at this, like, and have it be a sustainable career, and I feel like that's what people want. The people I talk to want to know, how can I do this full time? <laughs> then it's, it's really essential that you think about all of the things that I outlined so that you, because otherwise, you, first of all, you're not maximizing the number of people that you could reach and you need to reach new people every year. Sorry, can I cut, cut across you there for one second? We're not, yeah. seeing, we're not seeing you. We're, just seeing oh. a, we're hearing you perfectly, but okay. I'm just seeing a blank screen. And if we Let's could see. see your lovely face, that would be great. Let me take a look here. No, Google doing one of its funnies. We won't <laughs> waste I, time. We won't should waste I leave time and come back? It. No, we won't waste time on it because <laughs> what you're saying is the most important thing and a lot of people will listen to this. Okay, we've got your we've got your icon there. A lot of people will listen to this on audio anyway. So yeah, carry on, sorry. No problem. Um so for for a sustainable living, you you need to be thinking about how to mine new prospects. And that can be done in a lot of different ways. So I know that 
like I feel like right now the trend is to tell people just write more because writing more will lead to more readers and that's the best long-term strategy you can have rather than just trying to market the same thing over and over. And I agree with that to some extent that not every author is going to be able to write at that kind of a pace where they're producing, let's say, one to three books per year. That's pretty daunting to many of the people that I meet, especially the more literary authors. So in cases like that, aside from just doing more writing, which we all expect, you have to think more imaginatively or creatively about how to uh, repackage the work or to partner with other people in order to spread the word about what you're doing. And it doesn't have to be audio or it doesn't have to be video, it doesn't have to be Facebook, it doesn't have to be Twitter. People tend to get fixated on one form or another. And that's the point isn't to do all of them or to just do one of them, but to think about what can you sustain for the longest period of time and what you also think is going to best fit the nature of your work. So that's at play too. Some, some forms just don't fit as well as others. And you can usually figure out what that is after you experiment for even just a few weeks, you can usually tell. So if we're talking sustainability for a creative, we have to be talking enjoyment and pleasure. Um, you know, people who try to do this uh, in, a, in, a, in a form that hurts them if they're not, in, you know, if they're not enjoying it, it shows, I think, and, and the reader picks up on that. Any, any thoughts around that? Absolutely. I, a lot of people go about this very grudgingly and it turns into a chore. And like you said, uh, the audience or the readership picks up on that. So when I talk about sustainability, I'm also talking about things that you feel joyful to return to um, consistently. Things that, whether it's on a daily, weekly, monthly basis, things that you're not going to give up on because it's just become like, I always go back to the word homework or a chore because it's, you're not doing it because you feel like it's part of what you would naturally do. Like it's not coming out of like the wellspring of creativity. If you feel that it's totally separate, it has, bears no relationship to your creative work. That's, that's really hard to sustain. And the only reason I've been blogging for as long as I have is because it feels like part of my creative practice. So it's important to find the right fit in terms of what you can consider part of your practice. And I use practice very deliberately because we're not, I don't like to approach this as something really polished and highly, um, like the high marketing sheen, you know, where you, it's very calculated. I think, especially for people who are producing literature or anything that's, you know, very bookish, your audience isn't gonna like that sort of calculation anyway. So trying to be, your own genuine authentic person, whatever that is, whatever that persona is that you want to project, figuring out where your comfort level is and trying to sustain it. Do you think writers jump in too quickly? I mean, if, what, uh, what I'm thinking, there, there are two ways to go about this. Perhaps you, you stop and you think about who you are as a writer and what you're trying to achieve and what your books are, are doing and will do as time goes on and, you know, set up around that, if you like. But a lot of a lot of writers don't know that in advance they kind of have to write write yeah. the books to find out and try things so can you just talk yeah. about that kind of yeah experimentation yeah. thing <laughs> absolutely um many of the things that i just talked about in those slides i would place them at things you'll think about at a more intermediate level probably because it's hard to do any of that until you have a body of work in place and I, I use that term very loosely. So a body of work could be blog posts, it could be um, posts on social media, anything that expresses your worldview, your perspective, what kind of art you're trying to produce or information, the narratives that you're interested in. So it's you can't really build a readership out of, out of something that's just conversation. <laughs> so you, ne you need to have, something tangible people can look at and say, yes, that's that's the sort of work 
I enjoy. I really like what this person is doing and I want to follow them. So I know there's a lot of emphasis in authors very early, early stage careers. I should even say authors, like just aspiring writers to go out there and network and to be on social media or to build a platform or whatever. And while I don't suggest being a hermit, you also have to have some kind of center to what for yourself, to what you want to produce. And I think you're absolutely right that many writers jump in too far into the business end without even first establishing wh what work they would like to be known for. And I know that's a lifelong <laughs> like question you'll always be returning to, but so much I think gets done online without any idea of what, what your why is. I kind of like that question. What, not the what, like the book, but why this book? Why do you want to write this sort of thing? What message is it that you're hoping to spread? And do you have any sort of tips for people who are maybe at that very point, you know, who for because they're starting out? Because we know we have lots of people attending mm -hmm. Rindy Econ, Rindy Econ, Rindy Econ mm -hmm. um, who are just beginning. But also, I think I'm seeing a huge number of writers who have kind of tried all sorts of things because mm -hmm. marketeers. Uh, suggested that they should without knowing really why and mm. now they're ready to, to sort of go back to the drawing board and kind of work it out. So what should they be thinking about? Um, there are generally three questions that I think every creative person has to ask themselves at the outset. One of them is, do you want to make money at this? <laughs> because that can kind of direct what you're doing to some extent to truth. Because if let's say you're you really love to write Westerns. They're not really in vogue right now. So if you're going, if you want to have a commercial career out of writing Westerns, you're going to have to take a very particular path that's probably not through traditional publishing. Um, and so that has a very different set of considerations associated with it. So you have to kind of know where you fall on that question, how, how important the money thing is. Another question is how much you care about audience or what readers think. So there's, um, trying to think of the UK author, Will, is it Will Self, I think, very literary author. And I'll never forget reading an interview with him. I think it was in The Guardian where he said, I don't, like this mark of a serious writer is not caring what readers think. So if you're in that place, then that also really plays into a lot of the issues that we're talking about, because you're not really gonna be interested and engaging with readers the way John Green engages with readers on YouTube. You'll look at that and you'll be like, no, that's, that's, I will never do that. And that's okay, but you have to recognize the kind of fence that you're building around what's possible or what opportunities you'll pursue or what to expect from a readership. So all of these questions I'm talking about so far, these two, it's about having the right expectations of what you can achieve given your answers to those questions. And then I wonder if I'm going to remember the third question. <laughs> <laughs> we'll come back to it. It'll, it'll pop in when you're not trying to chase it down with the, the curls of your brain there. Um, I'd really like you to tell me what you're seeing, you know, from your kind of bird's eye view um, over the last, say, three years, say, since Indie Recon set out and what seems to be an awful long time ago, the Alliance of Independent Authors was born the same year. I can't believe it's only three years. It feels like 30 in not because I haven't enjoyed it, but because so much seems to have happened. So do you just talk through what you've been observing for the last, say, three to five years in this space? Sure. I, I think the one question that's often on people's minds is uh, the print versus digital divide, like the, how much we're shifting or not to ebooks versus print. And I think everyone's aware that we're now in a so-called plateau period. Um, which I think it, it, it may be a quiet period, but I still think we're going to be moving to majority ebook sales. So, but what I've noticed particularly is we haven't seen the same kind of shifts across all categories or genres. And so a lot of the self publishing uh, community, even though it's giving good information, I think some authors are realizing it's, it's kind of tougher, like if you're a literary author to get traction. And I just came back from AWP in Minneapolis, which is the big conference in the US for, for literary authors. And gosh, the biggest message I felt like I was hearing there is print is alive and well, like that community just hasn't shifted as much to digital reading. And in fact, some of the more innovative presses 
that were started as digital only are now kind of backtracking <laughs> and having print components because they realize their audience just is not transitioning at the same rate as everyone else. So one of my questions that I'm always thinking about is when will some of these sectors transition? I think they will, but I'm wondering about the pace and then how that affects those sorts of authors who are kind of waiting. Um, and then the other question that I think is actually more important than print and digital is, and this is something that Mike Shatskin talks about so much, is where are people buying the books regardless of format? Because there are fewer bookstores now, so that changes how books get discovered. So if more books are getting bought through online retail, namely Amazon, um, that puts so much power, and we've already seen the demonstration of this power, that puts so much power in Amazon's hands, as well as other big companies that have a role in what people see when they run a search, whether that's Google or Facebook or Apple or whomever. So the, you know, I know that you're aware, Orna, of how much people talk about optimizing your metadata and making sure the algorithms can see your book. And so there's, there's this groundswell of services and people who are trying to catch up both on the traditional side and the indie side on what it means to have your book optimized for discoverability in these online channels. On the flip side, I think people are maybe emphasizing that too much because even if you have all of that information correct and you should and you should tweak it and improve it um, there's still a lot of stuff you need to do that's like the softer marketing like getting getting quality reviews and getting other people in your community to speak up and spread the word about your work you can't really operate very long in a vacuum and just do your work and not acknowledge that you need the help of others. And so I think this is a theme that's been echoed a lot recently is this idea of collaboration, which I, you know, two thumbs up. Uh, I'm sad that it doesn't happen so much on the traditional publishing side. I meet authors who feel far more isolated, although I know they talk among themselves, but they feel a little bit more adrift and they don't know where to go for help. Whereas I think in the indie author community, I think there's real models to follow there for everybody about um, the collaboration and the assistance and sharing of best practices. Yes, there's no doubt about that. There's a, there's a real generosity there and a, a unique spirit, I think, um, just facilitated by the tools and the timing and the emotions that circulate around yeah. writing and publishing. And it's very interesting kind of ecosystem to me. I think it's really a, a very fine example of creatives at work where, you know, the creative impulse is foregrounded. Um, it's certainly in the indie author community, a very commercial sort of streak as well but in the main i think you see people working from a from a more creative dynamic and yeah. i find that very interesting did you think point number three by any chance um i did i it's <laughs> i knew you would <laughs> um what's your killer medium so a lot of people uh, obviously you're, if you're writing books you know the written word is is your core focus but beyond that what channels do you feel really show off your strengths? So whether, like I've mentioned authors who are really strong in audio or video, or they're doing really well on Pinterest. So finding that other thing that you do that can help position you and where you can like work on it as a growth opportunity over a period of years. Because I think it, as we discussed, I think it takes lots of commitment and sustained effort over a long period of time in order to see results. Um, I just shared a blog post that an author wrote. Her name's Delilah Dawson, I believe. Uh, she has a book coming out and she wrote a post about, please shut up, why authors shouldn't self-promote. And she, she put in there this experience of being on a panel and someone said, how can I um, get a book deal by blogging or something like that. And the response was, start your blog in 2005, <laughs> which is, you know, kind of accurate. People are kind of looking for like the magic bullet or the secret to using X social media to get a book deal. But that's, you can't use these tools as like just a means to an end because people can tell 50 miles away what you're trying to do. So you have to um, enjoy it and figure out what it is that you, what it is that you can do well on these mediums and let it grow organically and see where it leads rather than trying to engineer a book deal out of it. 
Would you go so far as to say that we are too fixated on the book as traditionally sort of um, put together between two covers of a certain length, you know, implying a certain sort of engagement with a topic and not enough with um, how do I sort of say what I have to say and find the best medium to, to, to get that across to readers. So in other words, that we're not really even talking content marketing here. Maybe maybe we're just talking about how to reach our readers. Mm. And, uh, you know, if we stopped thinking about them as ways to sell books and started thinking about the value that they have inherently themselves, will that be healthier, do you think? Yes. Um, plus 5,000 to that comment, um, especially for nonfiction authors, there's so much focus on the book artifact. And sometimes for good reason, because it can be like the linchpin. And for, for instance, a, uh, speaking. So if you want to be earning a lot of income that way, sometimes a traditional book deal is pretty much at the top of the list of the things that you'll want. But there, there's also just so many more profitable, useful, interesting ways to go about spreading information on the nonfiction side, including formats like this. And um, yeah, I mean, it's endless and people are so focused on this book and especially when some categories are just tanking in book form, like travel, like that if you're trying to build your career based on a travel book series, you're done, you haven't been paying attention to what's happened in the travel market. Some people are just that, like that's, they can't see beyond, beyond that book format. So on the fiction side, I think it becomes a little more difficult because I do think most people still enjoy narratives in that kind of traditional book form. But if you look at, for instance, Wattpad, I love talking about Wattpad because there's so many young writers there who are kind of going against the grain of what we know about how writers become writers or published authors. You know, they're writing in front of an audience, they're doing it very kind of informally. A lot of it's not that great, but after they're doing it for several years, you know, they're getting better. They're getting better as almost like as an act of performance. Uh, and that would, that really scares, I think, the older people who just want to write privately, not publicly. Um, but I think I'm very curious to see if that trend of kind of the serialized uh, novel really expands beyond Wattpad. I, I think it's right now it's a very niche activity from, from my perspective, but I'm curious to see as those people get older, people using Wattpad, what will happen? Yeah, fascinating. I love Wattpad too. I, I just think it's just so interesting. It's and it could change everything or it could change absolutely nothing. It could just be a form of, you know, the teenage diary years, you know, yes. but I, actually I do think that between the information and knowledge exchange that goes on and the consistent practice that you will in time see some masterworks arising out of there. Just before we go, can you talk to us about indie now, you know, self-publishing, um, your viewpoint? Right now, what the biggest message I hear from indie authors is that they need help with marketing and promotion. And it's it, not even so much that, um, well, let me back up. There are categories of people who want strategic guidance. And then there, there's a group that they want basically boots on the ground help executing. And then there are some people who really need both in one package. And I'm finding it so difficult to send people to a resource um, that would be trustworthy. There are, there are a few out there, but it, I feel like it's an underserved area and there's actually not a big knowledge base to send people to like, this is where you can find best practices on this because it changes so fast. And I think that's part of what's driving this anxiety from authors where they put their book out there nothing happens. They realize they didn't market it. I better get professional assistance. There's no professional assistance to be had. Um, well, there just, is, but it's no good. And it's very right. expensive. <laughs> There's plenty right. of it. But, um, yes, finding someone that actually does help. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's, that's, I feel like the biggest challenge right now for any author who hasn't been around a while and kind of gone through the trial by fire, or if they had previous industry experience, that of course helps a lot. Um, but, but the people who have no foundation to build on, it can be very hard to advise them what their next best steps are, especially if um, 
they're kind of stuck on, well, I've got these one or two books and I'm not ready or prepared to do more. I need to maximize these. And when the book's already six months old or even two years old, gosh, that's, that's so hard. And I'm not, I think that's the question I don't know how to answer right now. Okay, interesting. Well, we keep asking the right questions and hopefully we'll get some answers somewhere along the line. Thank you so much, as always, for a really, really interesting presentation. Um, all those different formats going around in that circle will probably haunt me in my sleep. <laughs> But, uh, and I know we'll all be going back in to look it over many times uh, to, to draw out the knowledge and wisdom in there. So thank you, Jane, for your time and your expertise. Always a pleasure. Thank you. It was great to be a part of the event this year. Talk soon. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye now.